Snap Judgment Studios. Get a behind-the-scenes look at Comedy Central's The Daily Show on Beyond the Scenes, an original podcast from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Every week, host Roy Wood Jr. goes deeper with notable guests and experts from the Emmy Award-winning series, and together, they use comedy to tackle current topics, from gentrification to gun laws, and take a closer look at how and why these topics matter. Listen to Beyond the Scenes from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Tuesday. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Snap. My name is Lynn Washington. From WNYC Studios, this is Snap Judgment. Classic. And now I get to bring out a man who's busy changing the world, one bad guy at a time, a rebel without a pause. He's a dear friend of mine. Please put your hands together for Mr. Josh Healy. <laughs> There's a famous story in my family. When my parents got married, there were two family members who were supposed to be kept as far apart from each other as possible. (laughs) My great-grandmother, Barbara, and my other great-grandma, Henrietta. Barbara and Henrietta, two little old Jewish ladies, two feisty, powerful giants, each standing tall at four foot ten in a bushka and heels. And they were supposed to be kept as far apart from each other as possible, but there was a mix-up at the reception, and somehow they got seated at the same table. And when they did, they proceeded to play every immigrant's favorite game, Who's Had a Tougher Life? Barbara came out swinging. She said, well, uh, you know that my family, we had to uh, flee Russia when I was five because the army came and burned down our whole village. Henrietta was like, all right, we gonna fight? Let's play. (laughs) Henrietta's like, oh yeah, well, the boat my family came over on, it was so bad, my little sister almost died before we got to Ellis Island. Barbara, she comes back flexing. She's like, oh yeah? Yeah, that's all you got, son? Uh, And obviously, this is how immigrant Jewish women talk. uh, Like bad battle rappers, straight out of the shtetl. Uh, She's like, yeah, uh, well, uh, you know, I had to drop out of school when I was 12 to work at a sweatshop on the Lower East Side. Henrietta's like, I wish I worked at a sweatshop. My whole family was unemployed during the depression. We survived 10 years off spam and matzo balls. No soup, just the matzo balls. And by this point, a whole crowd has formed around. All the families at the table, even my newlywed parents, they want to see the heavyweight bout. It's Ali versus Frazier. It's Nas versus Jay-Z. It's Barbara Rosenblum versus Henrietta Goldblatt, and Barbara goes in for the knockout punch. She stands on top of her chair, and in front of 150 guests at the party of my parents' wedding, shouts out, I had 12 abortions. (laughs) All self-performed. And that's the story that popped into my head 
when my girlfriend told me she was pregnant. <laughs> and I'm not proud <laughs> that that was the first thing that popped into my head. But given what happened next, it was kind of crazy. I was 19 years old a sophomore in college. So I was smart enough to know that when your girl tells you she's pregnant, the first sentence out your mouth should probably not contain the word abortion. <laughs> so instead, I went for something far more sensitive uh, and mature. When she told me, I was like, uh, for real? <laughs> like, for real, for real? You sure you're not just a little late? She said, I don't think so. It's been 15 days. 15 days. Man, I know nothing about women's bodies. <laughs> but I thought I would be able to notice if she was preggers. Like she smelled different. <laughs> Maybe like applesauce. Or every time she breathed, there'd be a little more air coming out. <laughs> you know? Her name was Esther. We'd been together for six months. And I said I love you to her every night. But I also said I love you every night to my couch. So I wasn't really sure what this was. Well, I say, there's only one way to find out. We go to the store, come back, and before I know it, I'm looking at this pregnancy test I just bought at Walgreens for less than a super burrito. I open the box, the cardboard cracking like thunder. I'm 19. I can't even legally have a drink to celebrate if it comes out positive. I mean negative. I mean, we go to the bathroom together. It's the first time I've seen a woman pee. It feels like she's going on forever. <laughs> like she's been storing the Pacific in her bladder for just this moment. Finally, the trickle stops. She hands me the stick, eyes closed. You look. Ladies first, I say. She does. She takes a breath. Looks like I'm going to be drinking for two from now on. I'm pregnant. For real, I say? For real, for real, she says, picking up her pants. <laughs> so what should we do? And I know what I'm supposed to say, right? I'm supposed to say something supportive and strong and sensitive and sweet and serious all at the same time, which is really easy in the moment. So I say, uh, maybe we should try another test. <laughs> but I can tell that is not the answer she is going for right now. So I say, look, 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 uh, you know I'm here for you. I'm here with you. And whatever you want to do, you know I've got your back and apparently your belly. What I'm really thinking is, please say you're not ready. Please say you're not ready. I mean, I don't want her to do anything she doesn't want to do, but I do want her to do what I want her to do for what she wants to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Esther sits down. She takes a breath. She takes my hand. She puts it on her belly. She says, I mean, I know we're not ready. I'm too young. You're too dumb. <laughs> it's a direct quote. I know it's not right right now, but I've always wanted to be a mother. I've always wanted to have a daughter. 
I say, you'd be a great mother whenever you think the time is right. She says, you know, it's funny. Ever since I thought I might be pregnant, I started thinking about baby names. If, so, if it was a boy, I was thinking Dominic. And if it was a girl, Barbara. <laughs> Barbara. Barbara. I never told Esther about my great grandma before. Uh, last month, I brought her home to meet the, my family, to meet the women who raised me. Strong women with old names like Dorothy and Deborah and Francis, my grandma, my mom, my aunt. I'd fallen in love with an Esther, a name so old when you're born it comes with an AARP card. <laughs> I was raised by strong women, women who taught me how to show respect, do my own dishes, say my daily prayers to Audrey Lord and Billie Jean King. It was my Aunt Fran who taught me how to roll a condom onto a cucumber. I was not paying close enough attention, apparently. <laughs> and it was my mom who first told me about the strongest woman in our family history, the woman who stole the show at her own wedding, my great-grandma, Barbara, who fled Russia and worked in sweatshops and had 12 abortions, all self-performed. No birth control, no clinics on the Lower East Side. She almost died in a tenement bathroom on Avenue C. But she lived. She lived and she fought for women and workers and immigrants and everything a nice socialist Jew used to do. She danced in the streets. She danced in the streets when they passed Roe v. Wade. She lived a long, hard, beautiful life like her, Barbara. When Esther said that name, I started to change my mind about what we should do. I said, maybe this mistake wasn't a mistake after all. Maybe we're supposed to have a daughter. She said, yeah, maybe not. Maybe not right now. I still need to become who I am to become a woman. And you, Josh, you definitely need some time to become a man. <laughs> and so a couple weeks later, we went to the clinic. And it was quick. It was safe. When the man with the picket sign outside said he'd pray for Esther's soul, she said, hey, good looking out. I held Esther's hand from when the doctor went in until the doctor came out. And yes, there were tears, pain, sadness, relief, all of the above. When it was done, I asked her how she felt. She said, I feel kind of hungry. Let's go get some lunch. And there were more tears over that meal. But when it was done, she was good and we were good. At the end of the day, it was just another, it was just a Wednesday at a doctor's office. No hangers, no back alley botch jobs. We were able to go on with our lives and graduate. And now, and now today, 10 years later, I'm still with Esther. Uh, yeah, you can clap for that. I do. And uh, she is my wife. She is, she is my midwife wife. Her job is to help bring babies into the world. And she helps women find their power, helps them heal, helps them make their own decisions, their own choice. And last month, Esther told me that she's ready now. 
She wants to have kids. She needs to have a daughter. There are lessons she needs to pass on. I agree, and I know someone else who would too. And we don't have any kids yet. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> we don't have any news yet, but we're already talking about names. And if it's a girl, there's one name, one heavyweight champ at the top of the list. Thank you. Joshua Healy. Holla when you hear it. Holla.